it was also very very cheap wine so like Fantastic. yeah you could get a you could get a relatively good quality wine for two euro seventy cents two euro seventy cents wow you're listening to the cosmic cast hello everyone welcome back to another episode of the cosmic cast you're here with me i fall in love with him more and more each week rick bieber here to my right the resident heartthrob tom harvey hello and um john's also here john permit fisher hi there and today we have a guest for you all he's never insidious but always igneous zoltan trecek hello everyone hello zoltan how are you doing uh could be worse could be worse <laughs> And uh, for all the listeners, I'm sure that enthusiasm will go through the oh, whole yes. of this episode. Yes, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, of course. Okay, We're in a slightly echoier room than usual, so we apologise if the sound is a bit off this week. Yeah. Um, uh, we're speaking in slightly hushed tones to try and mute that fact. Yeah. There's also this is because Elliot, yeah, <laughs> Elliot is asleep as well, so yeah. we just don't want to wake him up while we're no, doing No, he's like a little sleeping cat in the corner. Yeah, after only three coffees, I'd completely understandable. <laughs> yeah, that's true. A little known fact about Elliot, he chains through the coffees. He, uh, he uh, in our group, uh, by far drinks the most coffee. It's what yeah. gets him through the recording sessions, though, <laughs> yeah. to be fair. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cheers to you, Elliot. What you, the listener, don't hear is uh, the number of uh, outtakes yep. <laughs> and, and the tears. <laughs> as well. But anyway, this is all a tangent. We had, thank <laughs> yeah, you very much for coming in today, Zoltan. Something we normally like to start the podcast with is just getting to to know the guest. And uh, I guess a good question is: is how did you actually get into geology? Well, I was always really good at like geography and chemistry mm. in in high school. So. It felt like it, it is like a logical mixture of the two that you look at look at like the chemistry of solid minerals and mm. that's that, that's how I ended up applying for an earth sciences bachelor back in back in Budapest at the Utrecht University and I did a three year bachelor's in in earth sciences specializing in geology. I was already uh, working on alkali basalts during my bachelor's thesis, so I I looked at melting processes at intracontinental basaltic volcanic fields um, and then I did a two-year master's in geology specializing in petrology and mm. geochemistry uh, very surprisingly and I still worked on alkali basalts <laughs> and looked at intracontinental basalts and melting processes during during my master's thesis so yeah I did five years at, in undergraduate and postgraduate levels both at the Utrecht University in Budapest and then I thought that yeah I was doing quite well during my studies so uh, PhD was kind of like a natural progression. Yeah. I didn't want it to go to uh, work in industry because it's this this kind of knowledge what uh, I get it is not necessarily compatible with a lot of industrial mm. areas. So like apart from a few mining related uh, jobs, I, I most likely would have ended up doing something completely different mm. that I specialized in uh, during my studies. So I ended up applying for a PhD and the first... PhD rounds are usually in the UK around yeah. Europe, so the, because the application process starts, uh, oh well, you have to submit around January ish, yeah. while in other countries it's usually much later. So yeah, either yeah. during late spring or summer, uh, while here, yeah, it's it's three months before that. And I started applying, and I applied to three places. I got two interviews, and then I got one position in in Manchester. So, and, and that was in in March, mm. twenty sixteen. And because it was already like, okay, you've got an unconditional offer, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to risk and apply to other countries and yes. other places. I'll take this one and everyone will be happy. So, yeah, that's, that's how I landed in Manchester two, two and a half, more than two and a half years ago, not nearly three, yeah. And so it was an easy decision for you to think, I'm going to leave my, my home country, come some, to a different country. Yeah, I was, I've, I'm not necessarily felt like, that I very strongly have to stay in, in Hungary, where I'm from. Um, so for me, you know, I, I already had, uh, I already was able to speak the language, for example, which is does make it easier. very, very useful. Yeah. Yes, I had a quite high level language certificate, which okay, you can speak English. So yeah, that's, you that's don't that's have to show off that you speak English <laughs> yeah. better than yeah. all of we do. All of we do. There you go. <laughs> See, there it is. Nailed I mean. That one. <laughs> What can we do about that, really? Um, 
So you're a PhD student. What year are you in? Uh, third, third. Third, third so, year. Yeah. So you're nearing, drawing Indeed. to a close. Indeed, it is getting closer and closer every day. Very good. And so you're an igneous petrologist. Indeed, I am. So what's your project about? My project is titled Melt Generation, Degassing and Ebb Melt Evolution in the island of El Hierro, Canary Islands. So mm. it is the westernmost island of the Canary Archipelago, right. which a lot of people might know for as it is a very good holiday destination, but it is also an interesting area for volcanologists mm -hmm. and igneous petrologists because <clears throat> it is what we call an ocean island basalt the island, so it is an island chain, which is formed generally about areas where we've got anomalies in the mantle, for mm -hmm. example, terminal anomalies called hotspots or plumes. So uh, so similar to Hawaii? Yeah, it is, it is, it yeah. is thought to be very similar to Hawaii, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, so that's... And that's what we think the Canary Islands is formed by. A lot of igneous petrologists are interested in why the Canary Islands is actually there where it is and mm. how these magmas form. So I'm actually looking at those processes and I especially focus on the volatile content of magmas in the Canary Islands, which is a quite interesting topic considering we just started recognizing how large amount of volatiles could come from these ocean island puzzles like Hawaii or the Canary Islands or mm -hmm. a lot of other spots. Well, that's interesting. I guess uh, a good reoccurring theme throughout all these podcasts actually have been volatile elements. It seems to be a bit of an in vogue topic at the moment. So what does volatiles tell you um, in, in the case of the Canary Islands? What are you actually aiming to find out by looking at these volatiles? What the main question of my project was is... There was a very recent eruption in 2011, 2012, uh, on the island of El Hierro, just a one kilometer south of the coast of the island. Now, did I remember in the news that formed a sort of, did a new island start to surface? Uh, not, eruption? it didn't get to that point. Right. Uh, there were floating rocks, however, which were just like rocks that were very vesicular, so they mm -hmm. had a lot of bubbles and ended up floating on the top of the Atlantic. And um, there were people who just went out with ships and collected them. I don't know how. Might, might have looked, a big net, like a big, maybe. Yeah, yeah. big net. Of, yeah. <laughs> so I've also there were a lot uh, that was washed offshore um, to the southernmost village of the island. And, yeah, and there people started obviously working on these samples because this was the first eruption in the Canary Islands that was both monitored using geophysics. So seismical stations were in place and there were diffuse gas measurements. So there were on spot um, gas measurements of how much CO2 was coming out from the soil and whatnot. So that was quite an interesting thing to look at uh, for petrologists really, because you can link all these processes together. And two years ago, there was a paper that came out uh, showing that there is quite an abundant abundance of volatiles, especially CO2 and sulfur in the magmas that fed this eruption. And that's my project was mainly focusing on all the material and see whether this is a prolonged thing in the Canaries. And that's, how's your project going then? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's progressing. So most of the data about the volatiles I already got, and that's already written up into an mm -hmm. uh, article, uh, which is just going through peer review now. Okay. It's, hopefully it's in the very, very last stage of the peer review process. So I'll just have to resubmit it to the journal and hopefully it will get. Very good. Accepted. We'll be sure to link to that in the description. Probably by the time this episode goes out, hopefully that article might even be live uh, or accepted. Knows, a few more weeks possibly, yeah, yeah. How have you found the peer review process? So the peer review process for listeners that don't know. So this is how we uh, output our data as scientists. We write up all our results and uh, have a bit of discussion and a bit of interpretation. And it goes out to review where two, maybe three reviewers will then go over and with a fine tooth comb to uh, nitpick and point out flaws or... And sometimes they're even constructive as well, which is quite nice. Um, <laughs> and so you get these comments back and you then have to uh, rebut them and either say we agree or we disagree and modify the manuscript accordingly. And then so this is the process that you've, you've gone through. It can be a frustrating process. It can be a lengthy process. But ultimately, I think it does make one science good and better. How have you found it? Well, I, I, I totally agree that it does make manuscripts better that we've got this process and it wasn't necessarily problematic in this case at least so uh, it was faster than I expected so how long I, was it in review form um we submitted it in the beginning of January and I got it back at the beginning of March well that's so very that was, rapid it was two mm. months that's very only. good 
So a lot of my papers are in review for at least six months. I don't know what that says about the quality of my science, but mm. uh, <laughs> they, they take frustratingly long time sometimes. Well, I just think it's still odd that you call it science. John. <laughs> at that point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the random musings yeah. of... Um... <laughs> oh, you've, you've had a paper published, haven't you, Ricky? Yeah. yeah. So how, long did that, how long did that take for you, and how, how did you find that process? I think it was quite a long turnaround. Yeah. I think it was a good few months in between yeah. getting it back, the first reviews back from it. And I had a similar situation of... So my paper was looking at debris avalanches on the moon and um yeah i had a similar situation where there were a lot of com comments on it that you think aren't necessarily constructive in any way mm. but you have yeah. to respect it and understand that yeah. people are saying this because that's what they thought was necessary for the paper yeah that's pretty cool so what was the paper about then what was the main conclusions of this well uh, what we really tried to do is link the volatile data we get as so a CO2 sulfur concentrations together with trace elements, for example, which are a very, very typical to ligneous yeah. petrologists. So these two trace elements, then these are elements that are not found in great abundance, normally at like parts per million level within minerals. Yeah, yeah, like uh, up to a thousand ppm. Yeah. So 0 0.1 weight percent is what we usually categorize mm. as as trace elements in um, geochemistry and. Yeah, uh, we try to link these trace elements together with the volatiles. Trace elements are very useful for us, uh, as a lot of people have been working on trace element systems in igneous petrology for half a century, pretty much. And we could say that we understand quite well how trace elements work during melting and during uh, the evolution of melts. Uh, so, so trace elements will tell you about how the, the yeah for example how, how how enriched the mantle source is yeah. so how much uh, recycled material for mm -hmm. example is yeah. present yeah. Uh, in that mantle where mm -hmm. the magmas originally yeah. form and we were trying to look at whether the volatile enrichment which we found that is prevalent in most canarian mm -hmm. magmas can be linked to with other petrological indicators and it seems like that yes we can so there is um, an enrichment both in trace elements and volatiles and we don't have isotopic data but there is isotopic data in the literature mm. on on these these not these samples but samples that were Similar collected to, on yeah. the on the island of el hierro and the neighboring island of la palma which also show that there is something uh, some form of enrichment, some form of enriched component in the mantle. So, yeah, that's that's what our work really concluded, that there is recycled material and the recycled material is volatile rich and is the reason why Canarian magmas are so enriched in carbon cool. and sulfur. So this links, I guess, very nicely then to this big picture sort of view that you have subduction slabs going into the mantle and they're getting trained into mm. mantle plumes. And then you remelt this material, and that's what expressed at these these ocean island basalts. Then mm. yes, yes, and it adds uh, new um, information in terms of volatiles whether they can be subducted because there is it's still a non very strong ongoing debate mm. whether volatile elements such as carbon, mm -hmm. water, uh, sulfur can be recycled during this subduction process, and it seems that. To some degree, yeah. yes, yes, there is a possibility to recycle these elements. So, what would the argument be against why they can't be subducted and recycled into the during subduction? Yeah. Uh, well, the argument against was that during subduction, as you heat up the um, downgoing plate and increase the pressure on it, mm -hmm. um, there are certain phase transitions that go along in the subducting slab which breaks down minerals that carry these volatiles okay, right. and when these minerals break down new minerals form that cannot hold the volatiles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the volatiles become in a fluid like yeah. um, phase so like a mixture of like gas melt mm -hmm. something like that um, and they they just leave the slab and they yeah, go and into the yeah. um, above lying mm -hmm. mantle and they actually form the arcs so for example the andes or the um, caribbean, would caribbean be a good example. yes would yeah. be a good example as well japan uh mm. philippines places like that indonesia uh, these volcanoes are also very volatile rich mm, yeah. um, which is why they're so explosive and you have these massive big eruptions of big plumes i mm. guess yes kind of indeed yeah. um but it would seem that you're finding that they actually can go down to the plumes and be yes yeah, and yeah, then the, and this volatile enrichment can be present in places where you wouldn't necessarily expect volatile enrichment yeah, yeah. 
So a lot of the people that we've talked to, well, pretty much, I think everyone that we've spoken to so far has been planetary science mm. related. But this is this is a terrestrial project. Yes, yes. Mm. Which means presumably you got to go and do some field work. I did. What what was that like? What what sort of rocks were you looking for especially? Well, my work concentrates on these tiny little inclusions within crystals called melt inclusions because these are what we use for volatile measurements and to get good quality melt inclusions that actually preserve volatile contents well you need material that crystallizes very very oh well solidifies very 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 fast when it uh, gets to the surface so for example what we were looking for on the field and El Hierro were what we call scoria so these are like big heaps of uh, pyroclastic so eruptive material usually from Strombolian style eruption so the ones you see in the island of Stromboli uh, <laughs> that makes surprisingly sense. Um, that. <laughs> yeah and these and this material usually cools down very very fast and because of that the volatile content of the melt inclusions is usually better preserved mm -hmm. than in for example lava flows mm -hmm. so we did collect a lot of of these so uh, when, when did you go out there it was November and oh, end of October 2017. Okay, it was a really good time yeah. to go because it wasn't scorching hot yeah. mostly, but not that in the Canaries you can get too mm. much heat anyway. Uh, it is quite the same temperature all year mm. round, but yeah, it was it was really nice. Oh, what was the degrees. general day like for you when you were out there? Well, Bre well just breakfast sangria. Uh, I don't. Uh, no, not not necessarily. No, not sangria. I, uh, there is really good wine on El Hierro, though. <laughs> I don't think they make sangria okay. from it. They they drink it plain as it is. Uh, Unadulterated for breakfast. But, yeah, for yeah. breakfast most likely. Yeah, it was also very very cheap wine. So like, Fantastic. yeah, you could get a you could get a relatively good quality wine for two euro seventy cents. Two euro seventy cents. Oh. Wow. Yes, for a bottle. Uh, just just quite quite good. Mm. Um, yeah. What was a regular day look like? So yeah, we woke up obviously. Well, you wouldn't remember really what it was like <laughs> after all that wine, would you? <laughs> yeah. Um, so God. yeah, obviously woke up and then yes, you... then um, Sam, my my driver for the. For the <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my supervisors are there. This is Sam Bell, um, yeah, yeah. who you may have saw in our uh, LPSE vlog video. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, so we we got into the fantastic car, and yeah. then just she just drove around the island, and we occasionally stopped at various locations where I said, "Yes, this is where we are going to collect yeah. samples." So this was oh. chauffeured geology field work. Then. Yeah, I don't have a driving license, ah, so, that's not bad. so also you cannot go to the field alone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if 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 the volcano, for example erupts and then a, I don't know yeah. a piece of some lava in the way of, on your yeah. Yeah. well that'd be some excessive cycling if that was the case wouldn't it yeah. no yeah. it's interesting because I, actually, I, did, I did the same thing as well actually I don't have a driver's license and so uh, a friend of mine came along when I did field work in uh, Iceland and it was uh, quite nice being driven around <laughs> yeah, it, is, it, is, it is quite good especially after trying to scale like 500 meter uh, cliffs downwards to like find a specific sample you're looking for and then never actually find it um yeah so yeah. you literally drive to these outcrops and you have a just hammer off a piece of it or what what sort of volume of rock yeah. are you needing to collect yeah. to to make sure that you get something that you can analyze yeah we'd, we'd like those the stuff i previously uh talked about you usually need around half a kilo or something like okay. that so and the dose you don't need a hammer to collect mm -hmm. you just need a shovel <laughs> and then shovel it, uh, <laughs> dig a bit of a hole on the top of a scoria cone, and then yeah. oh, this is my sample now. Um, and you can just take it, obviously not. Yeah, no. Oh, we, we had a permit. Oh, we okay, had a permit. Okay. It's a national park. The whole island is a national ah, park, so we okay, had a yeah, permit yeah. which took f six months to get okay. uh, through the Spanish authorities. Yeah, so yeah. it was it was a yeah. fun process, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it was all in Spanish, so I didn't understand the word. I mean. <laughs> yeah. um, <coughs> Yeah, well, well, no, no, we were we were completely legal. Mm. Um, yeah. Always good, be always good to be completely legal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and we 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 collected some lavas as well, which we we actually did walk into outcrops and and hammered them. Hammered them off there. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So, yeah. did you end up bringing loads of stuff back? Were your bags full and heavy? Or it was only twenty kilos of sample I collected okay. because we had to get it on a flight, so we didn't. Yeah, does no one, it. when you're going through. Did no one ask you about... No one asked me, no. Yeah. I even had the form in my hand while yeah. I was checking in on yeah. the island. And after that, I, I suppose they didn't look at what the contents were. It was, yeah. Um, Airports do seem to vary in the extent to which they're bothered by rocks mm. in your bag. Mm. Yeah, I, um, 
I remember my dad and I went on a fossil hunting trip uh, and I had a piece of rock. It was like a very fine grained mm-hmm. mudstone um, and it had like a orthoco nautiloid fossil in it. And um, uh, apparently on the x-ray, it just looked like really densely packed powder. Uh, and so I had to completely unpack my yeah. bag, like demonstrate that it was in fact a fossil. Yeah. This took about like 10 minutes <laughs> and the poor um, security officer was eventually like, okay, I fine, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then he got to experience the exact same situation with my dad behind yeah. me. You had the other half of the fossil in the bottom <laughs> of his backpack. Um, the problem was you went uh, fossil hunting in the Natural History Museum, didn't you? Yeah, no, that must have bothered <laughs> that, them. That was yeah. probably yeah. the problem, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What do you love about uh, petrology and geochemistry and what frustrates you about petrology and geochemistry? <laughs> well, what, what do I like about it? This is, this is actually a very hard question. I, I have to think about it. I don't have a, a, a set answer. Um, what, what is good? I mean, it, it is quite a good field considering that you can go to the field, have like some form of outdoor experience, uh, do proper outdoors, geology. Um, and then you can go into a laboratory, get your samples analyzed, and then you need to use like proper scientific uh, methods so that are strongly related to chemistry and physics mm-hmm. to um, understand the processes that go through um, in, in magmatic systems, in my case, for example. Um, so like you have to understand thermodynamics. So there is a, lo- there is a lot of uh, bits from every scientific field really yeah that's inside. a good point actually i mean that's true so geology often gets a bad rap doesn't it you just cast your eye to popular media such as the big bang theory and they're always ragging on geology for some reason but it's the application of other science isn't it it's mm. what it is it's, it's, a, it's a very good point is there an element of the bigger picture in there as well because you're looking at this this rock essentially and you're working out what the interior of the earth what's what's going on inside the interior of the earth there are s- several um important things that igneous petrology looks mm. at. For example, we talked about volatiles yeah, yeah. before. And um, it is quite important to understand volatile fluxes, for example, yeah, that yeah. are coming out of igneous systems around the globe. Or it is also very important that um, where, so for example, how the interior of the Earth influences where uh, magmatic systems mm. manifest themselves on the surface. So yeah, that's that's, for example, also... Mm. A very important thing. And then what frustrates you then? What frustrates me? Um, yeah, when things doesn't work, mm-hmm. for example, it is quite frustrating. Mm-hmm. Uh, analytical equipment not behaving as it should, for example. Uh, that's that's one major issue, I believe. And then... Because I think, I think where planetary science divides slightly with what you do is you're in control of where you get your samples and when you get them. Whereas if you're looking at meteorites or you're looking at Apollo samples, for instance, you're on someone else's time. It's, it's dependent on when they can get those to you. But then you're both on the side of my equipment might, might not be working and then mm-hmm. there's nothing I can do about that. I've... Yeah, it can be more frustrating in that respect because, yeah, you're very limited in what samples you have. So, I mean, the techniques that we use are very similar uh, between both sides of the planetary mm. uh, geology or terrestrial geology divide. But... Yeah, there are some more added complications for sure. Yeah, indeed. There is one other thing is that's that's in the case, and this is very specific to, well, not necessarily very specific to igneous petrology, in petrology and geochemistry in general, so metamorphic igneous, that you don't have um, proper thermodynamic models, for example, when you've tried to understand pressure, temperature conditions, magmas evolve and things like that. You, you end up not having uh, people with experimental data that can reproduce yeah. uh, the compositions that you measure geochemically or whatnot, which, which you end up having. You've got a bunch of good data from very good samples from interesting locations, and then you are not able to do anything feasible with it because there are no models to input them. That's a very good point, actually. Um, yeah, there are a lot of gaps in that data set for sure. And I guess you know, these, these type of experiments are very long and time-consuming and they're not like big picture sexy stuff that tend not to attract big funding pots. So it's quite difficult to fund these things. But it's a good point. And it's even worse actually in planetary because when you're looking at even more obscure 
um, relationships of melts and even more obscure systems with even less chance of having relevant uh, experimental mm. thermodynamics for, yes, um, for those yes. systems. But yeah, so we could point, you know, if there are experimental petrologists out there, there's a whole career's worth of stuff to be done when there are gaps in our knowledge, for sure. That's a very good point. It's a very astute observation. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it's, it's way too much fun. Well, there we are, and that's why the data is lacking. So I guess uh, the problems you encounter aside, a question we, we always ask people at the end then is, if you, you weren't involved in igneous petrology, what, what were science do you think you'd like to work in, or is there any other science out there that you'd, you find interesting outside of your field? Hmm, what else would I work on? Um, again, a very interesting question. If I was better at physics, maybe I would, it would be quite nice to work on like theoretical chemistry or mm. things like um, inorganic chemistry, but more like applied uh, things. I also applied to like agricultural engineering when I was oh, wow. <laughs> applying for university. Really? I don't know whether I would do it this this time, but I think that was the fir third okay. option I yeah. highlighted on my. What did you find interesting form. about that? Uh, again, a mixture of chemistry and mm -hmm. geography, I okay. suppose, mm -hmm. um, to some degree. Yeah. Maybe, maybe food chemical engineering, food related chemical mm -hmm. engineering. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marissa Lowe was interested in food related yeah. engineering as well. Yeah. 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 I actually just photosynthesize, so I have no interest in food whatsoever. <laughs> well, yeah, it's good when you don't have to eat. So. <laughs> so on that note, I think we should say thank you very much, Zoltan, for coming on the podcast. You've been a very good guest. I'm sure we'll have you on again once, you're, once you have uh, other papers out. Indeed. Sure we'll do. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Well, thank you pleasure. very much.